chapter three, the centerpiece of all we believe. That's the heading for this. Okay. The yeah. centerpiece, centerpiece of all we believe. Okay. This Verse. version says Jesus is greater than Moses. Right. That's, that's quite, a, quite a difference. Yeah. yeah. I, I like yours. So my dear children, not children, so my dear Christian friends, companions and following this call to the heights, take a good hard look at Jesus. He's the centerpiece of everything we believe, faithful in everything God gave him to do. Moses was also faithful, but Jesus gets far more honor. A builder is more valuable than a building any day. Every house has a builder, but the builder behind them all is God. Moses did a good job in God's house, but it was all servant work, getting things ready for what was to come. Christ as son is in charge of the house. Now, if we can only keep a firm grip on this bold confidence, we're the house. That's what the Holy Spirit says. Today, please listen, don't turn a deaf ear, as in the bitter uprising, that time of wilderness testing. This is a quote from... Psalm 95, I'm guessing. Is it? I don't know. It doesn't say in the message. Uh, let me just I didn't check. look it up. I didn't do as much research yeah, for this 95. one. The reason I know it's Psalm 95 is because it's a very strange psalm. It starts with, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord and let's go to rejoice and come into the temple with great joy. And then halfway through the song, it's all happy and clappy. And then suddenly it says, today, if you hear his voice, don't harden your hearts. And it completely changes. We'd like to sing the first part, but we don't like to sing the second part. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, it completely changes. It's this warning. It's almost like they're coming into the house of God with such joy and then there's this warning about, hey, if you're going to be in church today, <laughs> be ready to hear God and yeah. don't harden your heart and end up like they did in the wilderness. Do you think that's because when we do hear the word of God, sometimes it's so arresting and challenging that we immediately just harden to it? Yeah. It can, I think can that's be a, that's, offensive to it us. It can be almost offensive. So and we these, surround ourselves with a wall of protection, like yeah, don't come any, don't closer, come any closer because it, it's uh, affecting me. It's yeah. hurting me. Yep. I think so. I think this is like this. This is this. I think this, this bit here is the second warning. Like we talked about each of these four mo, angels: Moses, uh, high priest, and sab, tab, and um, sacrifice. These four. Jesus is better than these four. All have a warning attached to them. So the warning here is, you know, yeah, you elevate Moses, but if you hear Jesus, don't you go hardening your heart against him, because if you do, you're going to end up like they were in the wilderness, dead in the wilderness. Is that saying that the message of Moses exists and it, it is what it was and they were used to the story of Moses, but the one of Jesus was actually going to be different to the one of Moses? Different or a um, clearer picture? A or clearer a full, picture. Full, That's full, a fulfillment of the one of Moses? Yes. Yeah. That it will actually affect you more than what Moses did. So yes. don't harden your hearts because this story is going to cut straight through. I think so. To you. Yep. I think the the... Benefits are more than the benefits of Moses, but therefore, because the benefits, because Jesus is better and higher than Moses, the potential, potential um, pitfalls or results or consequences—that's what I'm after. The potential consequences of not obeying will be worse than the consequences of not obeying Moses. So, the, in the last chapter, the author of Hebrews talks about angels. Mm -hmm. In this chapter, he's brought in Moses. Yep. Or why? Okay, so if we think about these four, and I'm going to keep saying it, they're all fundamental parts of Jewish faith. So we talked in the last episode about angels and how valid and important they were in Jewish culture and Jewish religious tradition. Moses is regarded as the supreme Jew. Now talk about Ab being children of Abraham. Yes, they are descended from Abraham, but Moses is the is the prophet they that the standard of prophecy that they regard as the primary one. Moses even says in Deuteronomy the Lord's going to send you another prophet like me. So he is regarded and uh, highly esteemed. In fact, even in John's gospel, the religious leaders say to Jesus, we are disciples of Moses. So they saw that he was the supreme one. He's the, So he's like the ultimate human being. And why is he supreme? Because he was the one who mediated and gave them the law and the Ten Commandments and oh, was so the one who rescued them. Connection. He had close connection with God. And he was the one who ultimately was involved. God used to birth the nation, set up, bring them through the Exodus, set them up as a nation, give them the law. So you can see why he would be top of the cream, top of the tree for the Jews. And so it's no surprise, if you know what the writer to the Hebrews is doing, it's no surprise after having shown the supremacy of Jesus over angels, the next logical person he would show them 
He's, yeah, you know your Moses? I'm going to show you Jesus is better than your Moses. Okay, so Moses was a great guy. He was the supreme guy, but Jesus is bigger and better than that. That's right. Yeah, that's what this argument's about. Could it be said that Moses was, well, he kind of laid the foundation for leadership in a way mm-hmm. and that Jesus was the example of that leadership? Why am I saying that? I'm saying that because you follow Jesus to new life. Yep. You know, Moses painted the picture. This is what it's going to look like mm-hmm. in the future. Yep. And Jesus is now the example of that. I think that's a great thought. If we continue that metaphor further, Moses brought the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt into, and was supposed to take them all the way into the promised land. We're going to pick, this is going to get picked up in probably the next chapter about rest, the Sabbath rest that God brought through Moses, brought the people into what was supposed to be rest. Jesus has done one better than Moses. Moses brought a bunch of slaves out of a Egyptian culture into a position of rest, sort of rest. <laughs> Jesus has brought all sinful human beings out of a position of slavery to sin into a place of ultimate rest. The hope is that he will bring you to a place where you will rest once and for all from your uh, from the pain of this world. In this in lifetime cre- or the uh, next? The, I think that's talking there. I think we'll see it in the context. He's actually telling them t- about the new creation. Yes, there's an element you can experience of that now, but hold on to the hope for the new creation. Uh, and that's why he's talking to a people. Remember I said last episode, he's talking to a people who are facing temptation to go back to the old way because it's hard, because we're not seeing the ultimate answer. So there's an element of you can experience a degree of this new covenant rest now, but hang on. He'll talk about that in Hebrews 11 because he talks about those who experienced some of God's power and those who didn't and were martyred and sawn in two, but they were waiting for the ultimate rest, the kingdom that lied before them. So in the, in the same way they hung on through the hardship, his encouragement is that we would hang on through that hardship as well. Are you encouraged by that? Yes, I am. You are? I'm encouraged. <laughs> of course, I, every, I would always love life to be easier, but this is, this is New Testament Christianity. This is the Christian walk, is that there are challenges. We do hold to a hope. Earlier in the year, we finished a series on Revelation, which was all about hanging on for the ultimate victory over darkness, understanding that we have that hope to keep us going, but in the meantime, we face troubles and hardships. First Peter, I quoted from recently in this episode, well, last episode, also writing to people who are persecuted, saying, hang on, keep going. And that's the message that you would give to people today, hang on. I think so. And that's what, that's the primary message of the book of Hebrews. It's written to, if it's written to a group of people who are facing temptation to turn away from their faith because it's hard, because there's persecution, because people don't understand you, because you're not getting the favors. Maybe you're having, you know, being ostracized in the community, sidelined in the community. And it seems easier to go back to the old way. Well, I think Christians today, we might not be tempted to go back to Jewish faith, but we might be tempted to give up on Christ or just water down our faith or maybe just come to church and get involved a little bit. Just do our basic duty, but not involve Christ in every area of our life because it's hard and we might be misunderstood. And I think that's very applicable to people throughout all ages. Should we allow Christ into all areas of our life? Yeah, that's what that's what we should definitely that's what should it's do because he's supreme. Yeah, so we should be involving him in every area of our life. What would that look like? Oh, <laughs> that's a good question. What would you say it would look like? Well, I don't know. Is it? I'm, am I supposed to get on my knees and say, Lord, I give you power and authority in my work. I give you power and authority in my family. I give you power and authority in my finances, which is the way that Christians talk about money. They use that word finances. Finances, yes. Days. Yep. Is it that? I'd say all of the above. And yeah. I and what am I expected to get through that? Do uh, I get anything? Hardship. Because, <laughs> well, hardship. well, Moses, um, when he brought the people out, not he, when God brought the people out through Moses from slavery into freedom, they were essentially given a new identity. Yep. yep. Does Jesus give me a new yeah, identity? Great. Very good. Yes. So that identity is a new a new authority a new ability to see things through a different perspective, which can at times lead to a different way of life. It could lead to supernatural provision or protection. But the, the writer to the Hebrews is making it clear that that any time you get that and you should pray for those things and believe that God will give you those things, that is actually a down payment on the future. 
That is a down payment on the ultimate rest, the ultimate kingdom of God. And even if at times you don't get those things, it does not mean that you're outside of the will of God. Sometimes you'll see the breakthrough and sometimes you won't, but always something will change on the inside of us because we are waiting for a day in the future when we will ultimately see God's kingdom come on the earth as it is in heaven. This is mind-boggling. Angels, future, what else are you going to throw at me, you, Pastor Rowan, and this I book? I don't know. It's, it's, um, I think it's an incredibly simple book for that reason. So much of the New Testament is written with this in mind. Christians, just keep going. Don't give up. Well, yeah, here, verse 12. So watch your step, friends. Make sure there's no evil unbelief lying around that will trip you up and throw you off course, diverting mm. you from the living God. For as long as it's still God's today, keep each other on your toes so sin doesn't slow down your reflexes. If we can only keep our grip on the sure thing we started out with, we're in this with Christ for the long haul. These words keep ringing in our ears. Today, please listen. Don't turn a deaf ear as in the bitter uprising. I don't understand any of that. They did. What's the bitter uprising? The bitter uprising was when Israel rebelled in the desert. With Moses. With Moses. Do you know the story of Korah and they rebelled against Moses and the earth opened up and they all fell into the ground? Yes, I do know. That's what it's referring to. So it's, it's, it's talking about the times in the desert, probably that time and others, where the Jews in the desert rebelled and whinged about Moses. Moses, why did you bring us out here in the desert to die? And all those kind of stories. So okay. don't be like them. Because so, what was it What was it ultimately that made them whinge in the desert and made Korah rebel? It was the fact that they brought God... God was using Moses to bring them into a place of blessing, but instead they were in a place of hardship. They had no water, they had no food, they had enemies around them, and that's what's causing them to whinge. So life isn't what we expected it to be, Moses. When you brought us out of Egypt, we were expecting a land flowing with milk and honey. It's not that. So therefore we're going to rebel against you. Now can you see the parallel with what he's saying? Yes. And that's the parallel we have to face. Is It's very easy for us to go, this isn't what I expected, Jesus. This is all too hard, this Christian life. Supposed to be all sunshine and rainbows, but it's not Jesus. So I'm going to rebel and go back to my old way. And Hebrews is telling us, don't rebel, stick at it, stay the course, because in the end, it will be sunshine and rainbows. Is this some kind of character test or something? Oh, I think that's a big part of it. Why would God do that? Because it perfects us. Are you saying it perfects me to go through suffering and hardship? Yeah. Why would you say that? I don't like that you say that. (laughs) Because Jesus went through it. It actually says Jesus learned perfection through what he suffered. Guess what book that's in? I don't know. It's in this book, Hebrews. What? <laughs> somewhere in Hebrews. And it's okay, by the way, to say somewhere in Hebrews because the writer to the Hebrews often quotes the Old Testament and says it's written somewhere. He never quotes, yes. <laughs> he never quotes it. Yes, it does. It's somewhere yeah. in the book of Hebrews. It says Jesus learned perfection or achieved perfection through what he suffered for the joy set before him he endured the cross. So if Jesus is being perfected through his suffering, and we are disciples of Jesus, as Jesus said himself, we should take up our cross and follow him. It's only fitting that we should go through those same sufferings. So we will learn perfection. We will learn maturity through hardship. And we will ultimately take that maturity into the new creation. So are you saying that when things hit the fan, (laughs) I should be asking myself, what can I learn in this moment? Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. What do I need to learn or yeah. where is God or, or look for him rather? Look for him. James says it like this. Consider it pure joy when you face trials and tribulations of every kind because you know the testing of your faith produces perseverance. That's a says. terrible verse. It's a t- I think Amanda, Amanda Bartley says it's her least favorite <laughs> verse in the whole Bible, I think. But I that's that same that. principle. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's, it'd be, it would be nice if we didn't learn through hard lessons, but it's life. I suppose, though, if we didn't have the hard lessons, would we understand God's greatness? Yeah, right. Would we see his grace and mercy? Would we see him at work in our life? I don't think we'd recognize it. I think it's through those challenging times and seeing God move that we experience his grace and goodness in ways that we wouldn't otherwise have experienced. So during that bitter uprising, was God trying to get the people to get their eyes off themselves and look up and see him at work in their lives and remember what he had um, 
get them to remember what he had done, bringing them out bringing there. Bringing them out. I think that's a big part of it. There's also another part of it, which is just trust Moses, my servant. Trust in Moses that he is my servant. He is representing you before me and, I, and, I'm, rep- and I'm represented by him before you. And if you can trust Moses and follow him, even there's a time when Miriam and Aaron even lost their way and didn't follow him. But if they could follow Moses, Moses would lead them under God as an under shepherd into the promised land. And they were meant to go straight to the promised land. Yeah, it seems that's the case. Yeah. But did they, using these words here, did they take their eyes off the prize? Did they not watch their step? Did they not listen? I think all of those things. And they saw the problem was insurmountable and saw didn't think they could handle it. They didn't think God, their big, God was big enough to deal with the problems. All of those things. That's why this lesson is so important to us. First Corinthians 10 verse 11 says, talking about, Paul's talking about those, these same counts in the, in the wilderness. And he says in first Corinthians 10 verse 11, these things are written down as examples for us upon whom the end of the age has come. So referring to all those lessons in the Old Testament, and he's going, they're actually been written down for us now that we also would learn from those persecutions, those hardships, those times when, when the Israelites turned their back on God or stopped believing or doubted him. And look what happened to them. They're examples. Don't let that happen to us. Okay. So I can see now why you're saying the warnings mm-hmm. here. So watch your step, friends, is a warning. It's a warning. Remember what this happened to these guys yep. so that it won't happen to you. Yeah. And usually the warning is one up because it's, it's, a, it's, it's a, more serious warning because the supremacy of Christ over all these other examples is so great. Therefore, the consequences of not honoring Christ are even greater than what the Israelites missed out on. So they might have missed out on the promised land, taking a promised land, but what will we miss yeah. if we miss Christ? It'll be worse than missing out on the promised land. It will be missing out on the ultimate promised land, the new creation, which is so much better than the nation of Israel, the land of Israel. Now, when you say, what what will we miss out on? You're not meaning salvation because this person has given their life to Christ. Um, no, actually, I think Hebrew, oh, you mean Hebrew, that Hebrews well? does actually warn against that. It says something like, "What?" one of these warnings will say something like, what will we get if we neglect such a great salvation has been offered to us? Okay. So is I think it, there is sorry. a warning against that. But it is, is it also suggesting that on your walk with Christ, you can miss out on things? Yes, and that too. Things. You could miss out on seeing the goodness of God in the land of the living as well as the ultimate okay. salvation. Yeah, both. So is this sort of the same idea um, of having a childish faith, being fed this kind of milk, and then you, your faith matures? We're doing chapter six today, aren't we? Yeah. Yeah, eventually. <laughs> Well, it'll be yeah. for Friday's episode. Yeah. That yeah. is exactly what it says in Hebrews chapter six, verse one. Okay. Let us not, let's leave behind these elementary things, these childish beliefs and move on to greater things, greater understandings. Right. So through suffering, there is a growth period. If you keep your eyes on the prize. Yep. That's such a funny way to say that. If you keep your eyes on him, yep. uh, you will be grown in the moment and yep. you will get greater rewards. I, I, don't, I want to use a better word there. No, that, I think that's a valid, we tend to shy away from the, the word because we don't want to be seen as proud. But yeah, that seems to be the promise in scripture. Your rela- And is that your relationship with Christ grows, there's more trust between, I don't know if you can say between the two of you, between you and, you certainly trust God we, more. We trust God more. Yep. Because I don't think he ever trusts us, does he? I think it's amazing that he, he gives us what he gives us, even knowing how untrustworthy we are. Well, that's, that's called grace. True. Grace. Yeah. So he hopes that we take a step forward and he meets us there. Mm-hmm. Is that right? Am I, I think thinking this right? Yeah, I think that, keep going. Yeah, that's that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. You're getting into realms of free will and predestination and all that, which is we're not don't no, want to go I wasn't that trying path to head today. There. Yeah, but I think that's a fair call that God has willingly graced us with so much and we are called to respond to that. And that's what this book is. Are you going to respond or not? If you don't, there will be consequences. But if you do, there'll be wonderful joy and blessing and growth that will come from that. I heard somebody say the other day, you're going to go through hardships anyway in life. You're Mm -hmm. going to go through suffering. There's going to be terrible things because that's just what happens in human life. But how much better it will be for you if you go through those things 
with Christ as your that. guide. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. So it's yeah. going to happen anyway. It's going to happen anyway. You're not going to avoid it. Yeah. So you might as well have Jesus on your side to go through it. Yes. Yeah, I like that. Yeah, me yeah. too. Yeah, I think that's really good. Because the temptation is, which is what they were facing, is if I don't if I don't stick with Christ, it'll be easier. I won't go through it. If I just go back to being a Jew yep. with all the protections that the Jews had in that Roman culture, they were allowed to practice their religion and they got away with things that none of the other pagan nations could get away with. If I could go back to being a Jew, I wouldn't face this hardship. And that's the temptation we all face is it's got to be an easier way to do this. If I give up on Jesus or I don't involve him in every area of my life, if I don't make him number one in my life, and maybe he can be there and thereabouts, but if he's not number one, it'll take the pressure off. Life will be easier. I'll be able to parent my kids easier. And that's the voice of the enemy coming in. Because like you said, it's actually not going to be that way. You're going to face the problems anyway. But the voice, the temptation is, oh, if you don't involve Jesus in this, your life will be easier. Yeah, that's a real temptation. Mm. And I think we come to that because we think God's not listening. Mm -hmm. He doesn't care. He's not answering our prayers. Would you agree with that? Oh, yeah. And that's exactly what these Jews are facing yeah. in the first century. So in a hardening of hearts or rebellion, we say, well, God, if you're not answering me right now, I'm going to go do this by myself. Mm -hmm. Oh, that reminds me of what somebody else said to me. Some people say really good things to me, but I don't ever remember who said that. <laughs> Actually, I do. I see her in my mind right now. She said, how big is your God through this? Think about how big your God is in the situation is the situation that you're in is, is he big enough that he will bring about the change or is he of a size where you think you need to do something oh, love that. yourself? Love that. Yeah. So that makes sense what oh, I said? Oh, 100%. Yeah. <laughs> she said it much better oh, than that. that. No, that's spot on. That's such a good thought where we think it rely, everything rises and falls on us. Yeah. So in a way of stepping away from God is – saying, well, you're not coming through in this moment, so I'm going to start doing this. Yeah. I'm going to create my own Ishmael. Yep. That's in the exactly moment what's going on. I'm going to fix it. I'm going to fix, fix this myself. myself. Yeah. Yeah. We all do that. That's the temptation we all do. Love it. I, I'll fix this myself. And that's a lack of trust. And that's what they were doing when they were rebelling in the desert. We'll fix this. We'll go back to go back to Egypt if we have to. Let's just sort this out ourselves. We'll pick another leader. We'll do something different because this isn't working out the way we thought it was going to work out. Yeah. But that's the journey of trust is going, no, God sees a bigger picture. And it is through the valley of the shadow of death that I will come to a place where God will provide at my table, as it says in Psalm 23. So we have to journey through hardship to get to a place of blessing. And it's in that journey through the valley of shadow of death that we face the temptation to go, no, this isn't working or this isn't going to work or there's no light at the end of the tunnel. So I'll just, I'll just take a turn away, find another way out of this tunnel. I'll do it myself. Usually you end up digging yourself into a darker tunnel. And what you're talking about there just makes me think of the rest, the rest word that you said, we have to come into his rest. It's hard to sometimes come into his rest because we essentially have to give up yep, we what surrender. we're trying to do. Yeah, that's right. And yeah, he, The Hebrews writer is going to pick up this in the next chapter and talk all about rest. That's exactly where they're going. Because this Sabbath rest, that what, is, what does it really mean to rest in God? I'm just going to read this next bit, the last few verses here. For who were the people, sorry, that, that actually is right. <laughs> For who were the people who turned the deaf ear? Weren't they the very ones Moses led out of Egypt? And who was God provoked with for 40 years. Wasn't it those who turned a deaf ear and ended up corpses in the wilderness? And when he swore that they'd never get where they were going, wasn't he talking to the ones who turned a deaf, a deaf ear? They never got there because they never listened and never believed. So how important is it for us in our life, our walk with Christ to first of all, listen, and secondly, believe? I think it's important that this version ends with, and which will lead into the next chapter, it says, so we see that because of their unbelief, they were never able to enter his rest. So belief is a big thing. It's, it's active. What do you so mean by active? Belief isn't just a mental assent thing. Belief what is, does even that mean? Oh, I believe in Jesus. That's a mental ascent? That's a mental ascent. I believe that I Jesus I see ascent is going sins. up. How is that going up? <coughs> ascent has two meanings. Uh, an agreement. Agre got it. The word okay. also ascent, I think, yeah, it means agreement as well. I, I'm assenting to something. I'm probably spelled differently, is it? A-double-S-E-N-T? Don't a -S ask me right now. Not A-S-C-E-N-T? Oh, yes. Yes. A yeah, yeah, two different spellings. So ascent to something can be to agree or believe in something. 
Got it. I acknowledge read, it. Okay. I saw it as A S C E N T. Yeah. So a mental assent, I believe, is an acknowledgement that, oh, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Well, I think it's James will say even the demons believe in Jesus and they shudder. So um, it's not just enough to acknowledge. As Christians, we can't just acknowledge our belief. We need to act on that belief. That involves all of these things, actively engaging in learning. Some, some of the things that he said there, I love the way you put it. What was some Listening. Of the, listening. They never listened. They never listened. And well, they, they never believed. They never believed. So they're both, and we know from the Hebrews, uh, from the Old Testament, the word Hebrew, Shema, for listen, hear, is more than just listening. It's it's active acknowledgement, engagement with. That's the Christian life. Don't just be fooled into thinking, oh, I believe in Jesus now, I can live however I want. That's not listening. That's not believing. Have you seen that old movie, White Men Can't Jump? No. Never Are you serious? I'm serious. You should see the look on With her face Wo- right now. Woody Harrelson? Have we talked about Woody Harrelson You've before? You've talked about Woody Harrelson before. I don't think I've ever seen anything with Woody Harrelson. White Men Can't Jump. No. Go watch it. Okay. Okay, because in that, the, the entire discussion is around, <laughs> you're listening to me, but you're not hearing me. Or maybe it's the other way around, but you're listening, yeah, you're listening but, you're but you're not, but you're not hearing. hearing. Yep. Yeah. yeah, because hearing implies the active. He- yeah, hearing implies something, doing something with that. Yeah. yeah, and that's what the Bible is actually talking about all the way through. So the rebuke here is, or the challenge here, is actually are you going to do something with this Jesus? Are you going to allow him, if he's supreme over Moses, are you going to allow him supremacy in your life over Moses? Over Moses. I'm- and over over everything. Do you do that? Do you have to actively do that every day? Say, I give you supremacy. Um, yeah, I, I think I do. Or the supremacy. Yeah, yeah. I don't always use those words, but I'm always thinking, Lord, I need you today. Come through for me. I'm, I'm giving you um, direction over my life today so that the things I do will actually count for something. I will honour you and put you first in my life. That's the kind of conversation I quite often have. And it's often just a breath prayer. It's not. Like I'm not saying I've got a written prayer list that I use every morning on, especially around that. But it, I feel as though I do. I do it every day. Uh, hopefully, I do it most days. Here's something else I heard this week. It was a big week. Sounds like it. <laughs> you have to say things with your mouth, with your tongue. I see. And by saying them, you start to believe it. Essentially. Uh, yeah. Okay. At, that it stirs within your soul. And you grow more in your faith and belief. Is that true? Yes, I think that's true. Um, Jesus seems to indicate the importance of saying prayers. Um, And God brings, God's words are creative. And if we are created with that, um, with that uh, same ability as God created in his image, we have been given the authority to create on behalf of him with our words. So I think there's definitely validity. Jesus said, you shall say to this mountain, be removed from here to there. So there's definitely power in saying things, exercising that God given ability to declare things with our words, not, but, and I also think that there is plenty of space for, uh, breath prayers for just consciously aligning myself with God in a moment where I might not get a chance to say anything because I might be talking to someone and I'm just aligning myself with God. God, give me the right words to say. And I'm just under my breath just saying that. Okay, so that's consciously aligning is I agree with you or how do you do that? Yeah, Lord, use me in this moment. Give me the answers. Lord, I want to work through you. Lord, I need you. All those kind of prayers. So there's a space for and all the church. The church fathers have understood and taught this throughout church history, the power of these breath prayers, these these alight, these short-term instantaneous alignments, as well as the more drawn-out lengthy prayer. So I don't think it's an either-or. I think they're all valid forms of prayer. If I, all I was ever doing was doing under the breath, under the, under my breath prayers and never actually declaring anything, I would not be using the full range of prayer that's available to me. However, I think there are others that probably only focus on that and becomes almost like an incantation magic spell. If I don't declare something, I'm not going to see it. Whereas I think God understands Jesus, understands us at that breathy level as well. So Jesus at the tomb of Lazarus, he says, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. But then he says, I know that you always hear me. I'm saying this for the benefit of those around me. 
So it, we, in the, the implication is Jesus didn't need to say anything in order to be able to raise Lazarus from the dead. He did it because of others around him. So we can't build a doctrine that says unless you say Lazarus come forth, that Lazarus wouldn't have come forth. Jesus could have brought him forth any other way, but he did it for others. So let's just not let's just not compartmentalize that doctrine of prayer all into a one size fits all. They're all valid forms of prayer. Yes, I agree with you. I've got two thoughts. Hopefully, I don't lose either one. Okay, I'm going to go, to go with Moses first. Okay, I think I've lost the other one. Oh, wait, <laughs> give me a second. So. Moses, God didn't have to use Moses to rescue the people, but mm-hmm. he did use Moses and then Moses sets up this character, this yep. person, Yep. right? God could have done it anyway, mm-hmm. but he's used Moses as an example, mm-hmm. right? Yep, yep. Tracking yeah. so far. Okay. That was just the, in, that was the individual th- thought, yep. just to say that God can do anything he wants, but he uses, like he, Jesus spoke to show. Yep. God used Moses as an example. Yep, agreed. Agreed? Yep. yep. Okay, I'm just trying to understand it all. Yep. And the other thing is around the prayers, those, what do you call them again? Breath, breath prayers. Breath prayers or declarations or whatever. Yep. Or any kind of praying is a way to grow my faith. Yes? Yes, that's part of prayer. Okay, yep. so by praying, that is actually me listening and expressing belief. Yes, that's part of it. If it's that's active, it? yes, that's part of it. it. That's it. It's active. Yes, it's doing that's, something active. Got it. With my belief, yes. So yeah. it's not just this mental ascent. It's I'm actually going to pray about this. I'm going to do something. I'm going to engage with this promise in some so way. So praying is being active in your faith. Just to yes. cl- clarify that yes. again. again. Yes. So it's not me just going, God, help me in this part, which you can do. It's actually, that's okay too. Yes. So prayer can be active and passive. And I think it, it's more recognizing that there is times for both and it's okay. So some people, some people who are only ever in active prayer will actually say, well, no, it's, it's not right just to just sit there and do nothing. But there are times when you just need to sit and surrender. Prayer is passive in the sense of saying, God, I've come to the end of myself. Now it's over to you. And that's okay oh, too. There's so much in this. Cause that's, <laughs> isn't that any relationship? There are times when if I'm in a relationship with my wife, there are times when I'm giving to Jill and then there are times when I'm receiving from Jill. I think that's a normal, healthy relationship. And so... Um, Wait, are you saying I should expect God to answer in my prayer time? That I should be expecting God to give me something as I'm praying? Sometimes, but not all the time. Sometimes it's active and sometimes it's passive. Sometimes oh, it's just too surrender. much. Just think Angels, of it a, just, <laughs> everything. Think of it like a relationship, Jeannie. A relationship. Yeah. Relationships are multifaceted. A relationship with a creator God who thinks me – in my humanity is worth something yeah. worth like something well, worth huge. Ele- worth elevating above the angels. Ah, oh, yes. So what? And made- his son gives his life to me for me. I just, I don't understand. This. Incredible. It's all too much to comprehend. It's, um, well, Paul says, Oh, the depth and the wisdom and the wonders of God. It's beyond comprehension. This is what he's talking about. This amazing grace that we, every time we think we grasp it, God just goes deeper and shows us there's more. Yes. It's like you get a little bit and then it kind of undoes and unravels yeah. and you've got to find yeah. more meaning, more yeah. purpose. And we will be mining, we've rather. talked about this before, we'll be mining the riches of God's grace from now until eternity. I still just cannot comprehend the idea that a creator God would even care about humans. Yeah. But then having said that, I can see that there are some beautiful qualities within humans Yep. So a part of me starts to argue and go, hang on a minute. Some people are really, really amazing. When some people give, some people N.T. Are Wright funny. says like, the line between good and evil runs through all of us. Like when you say some people are good, some people are bad, I think in most cases, most people are good and bad. Did I say some people were good? I don't think well, I You said some there. people are incredibly generous and all that. Generous, Yes, yeah. that sort of thing. That's but what I mean. Yeah, you didn't say the word good, but, you know. But I think humans are, are capable of tremendous – amazing things for good or ill. And I think all of us are to some degree or other capable of amazing good things and amazing evil things. But even the amazing good things are just tainted by human sin without this wonderful gift of grace of Christ, which hopefully brings us to a point where we bring more of the goodness of God into the world and less of the evil of Satan into the world. That's the purpose, right? 
I think so. Or the plan. That's the yeah. plan, the divine plan of God that heaven would come to, to do. earth. Yep. Yeah. That heaven would be reunited with earth. Okay. So you've got in this angels, heaven reuniting, <laughs> reuniting with the earth, Moses, wilderness. There's so many things going go, on. We, yeah, we're gonna, high priest. Yeah, we're going to head to yeah. rest and the high priest. So we're going to finish the chapters off with all that stuff okay. over the next few chapters. Because I'm utterly confused, but I'm going to continue on with the next chapter. Okay. <laughs> You're utterly confused. Let's see if we can confuse you more. That's very That's likely. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you next episode. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to this episode of The Bible. Wait, what? Be sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast so you don't miss a single episode. And you can also find us on all the socials. Just search The Bible. Wait, what? And to find out more about our church, just search C3 Camden, C3 Picton, or C3 Thoreau on the web or on the socials. Thanks for being with us today, and we look forward to talking to you on the next episode of The Bible. Wait, what?